Okay, so greetings. Now, what I wanted to do in this uh, shortish presentation is just to give some overview of St. Thomas's approach to habits and virtues um, in order to sort of give a little bit of a framework in which to slot in the readings that we're going to do for this uh, um, summer school, this uh, 2019 Aquinas Institute of Ireland summer school. Um, it's going to be somewhat introductory. So for some people, maybe it's not going to be a particular utility because they know the stuff. But for others, I think it could be of use um, because, uh, yeah, just, just getting an overview can just be helpful then when you get into actually St. Thomas's own words. Now, the um, we're reading parts from the uh, Prima Secunda, well, which is, well, we're reading, going to read uh, texts which are from the second part of the Summa, which itself is divided into two parts, the Prima Secunda and the Secunda Secunda. Um, and in the Prima Secunda, the first part of the second part, um, St. Thomas gives his kind of general understanding of habits. And then in the Secundus country, he goes through in quite a lot of detail um, a whole range of um, habits and, uh, you know, prudence, temperance, fortitude, these type of things. Um, and we're going to read some selections from those texts um, as well. Now, when we consider just his habits as such, St. Thomas makes the point that uh, there is a kind of... Um, there are four principles which describe uh, human activity. And these principles are, uh, first of all, the emotions, uh, then the habits, then law, and then grace. And what he means by that is that our emotional world, the passions, they can uh, prompt actions. Uh, and then habits are a very important source of human activity. They explain how we act, the way we do act. Also, law will do that, which somewhat constrains us uh, in our actions or guides us in our actions, at least. And then grace, which supernatural principle, um, which allows us to act in a, in a supernatural mode. Um, and obviously, we're just going to be looking in this summer school at the idea of um, habits. But that just is to situate it. When St. Thomas is talking about habits, he's talking about a very important element of, of how we can explain moral uh, activity. Now, generally, uh, I would say that St. Thomas operates with a definition of a habit as a semi-permanent disposition of one of the powers of the soul, which uh, incline that power to operate in a certain way. And that immediately, therefore, gets us into a threefold distinction, distinction between powers of the soul, actions which flow from those powers and then habits which in a certain sense sit between the power on the one side and the action on the other what they do is they dispose the power to act in a particular manner now what i've got on the screen here is a diagram which tries to encode uh, from st thomas's point of view the different powers of the human soul so the soul itself is is uh, an immaterial entity or the rational soul is an immaterial entity which is uh, in forming the body and making us to be a living uh, bodily reality. But it also has certain potencies or powers. And the powers can be divided into here, I hope you can see my cursor, which is moving now, the vegetative powers, sensitive powers, and then the rational powers. Uh, and what, what I just said was that, the, uh, that habits are semi-permanent dispositions uh, of uh, certain powers of the soul which incline those powers to act in certain ways. Not all the powers of the soul, I'll explain this in a minute, not all the powers of the soul can actually have habits, but some of them can have habits. Vegetative powers are here, I've listed the three, nutritive, augmentative and reproductive. They are powers which uh, we share in common with um, animals uh, and plants. So uh, they plants, even lower than animals, can, can take in nutrition, they can uh, grow and they can reproduce. The sensitive powers we share uh, just with the animal world, uh, leaving aside at the moment locomotive powers, the ability to move. We have a knowing powers or cognitive and we have a petitive or um, impelling uh, powers. Uh, and down here, some of them will be well, obviously you know, fairly uh, familiar to us amongst the sensitive knowing powers, sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch. Then we have actually some interior powers such as the imagination and uh, the memory. Um, this, this some of the detail here is not so important for us, but what's just important to see is that we have different powers of the soul. The appetitive sensitive powers actually are where the emotions are, or the passions, I'm using the word emotion and passions uh, synonymously there, 
uh, we divide that into concupiscible and uh, irascible. Again, this, the precise reason for the distinction is not something I need to or really have time to go into in this pr presentation. Uh, so just have to sort of bear with that if, you, if you're not sure what the distinction is there. And then the rational powers we kind of share with, uh, well, with angels or the intellectual powers. There's cognitive, the knowing, and then there's the rational uh, appetitive power, which we call the will. Now, if you're human, you have all these powers. Uh, they come as a sort of package with the soul. And uh, however, they, they don't have in and of themselves any particular inclinations built into them. Um, and so they are, at least when we talk about the, the sensitive uh, powers and the rational powers, they are um, trainable, if we can put it that way. They are able to be um, somewhat, you might say, added to in such a way that they operate in certain directions. And that's really what we mean by a habit. So, for example, uh, if we take something like the uh, concupiscible power down here, this would be where desires are, for example, like sexual desires are, are located. And therefore, we can talk about the power, the concupiscible power, and then its actions, for example, the action of sexual desire. So on one side, we have the power and we have an action. But as I also just previously intimated, there can be a disposition in a certain sense sits between the power on the one side and the action on the other, which inclines that power to operate in certain ways. And the obvious uh, habit that's, that comes to mind now is, for example, temperance or chastity. That means that we have the power for sexual desire and we have the activity of sexual desire, but actually there can be something which comes along and is added to the power which inclines the sexual desire, the actions of sexual desire, in particular ways. Obviously, in chastity, it inclines them in, in a, a reasonable uh, way. Um, there's something also similar, actually, if we take the rational powers, rational power of cognition, the intellect. I mean, everybody who is human has that, but it, in a certain sense, is kind of um, blank, if we can put it that way. And it also can have certain dispositions added to it. For example, languages, actually, uh, in the Thomistic system are a type of habit because um, you have the power to speak, for example, Russian. All humans have intellects and therefore potentially could speak, speak Russian. And then there are a whole set of human beings who actually do speak uh, Russian. But they're not always speaking Russian. They're not speaking Russians. Uh, you know, those who live in Moscow are not speaking Russian in uh, in their sleep, or not you know, commonly speaking Russian in their sleep. So they have the power of the intellect, as we do, and they have activity of speaking Russian. But they also have something which remains in them: the the skill or the inclination to speak Russian, even when they are not actually speaking Russian. Now, the reason I'm getting in all to into all this is to, to push home this point that we have on the one side powers of the soul and on the other side those powers have certain actions but something can sit between on the one hand the power and on the other hand the action namely a habit which is this semi-permanent disposition which inclines the power to act in a certain way. It, it, it in skills, you might even say, the power to act in a certain way. So if you really have the, the habit of the language of Russian, then you have an intellect which really can bring about the action of speaking Russian. Now, I don't, I don't have that, but I do have an intellect. Uh, and I could sort of, as it were, be forced to say certain words, you know, daspedanya or spasiba or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I can make the forced action of speaking Russian and I have the power to do it. But I don't have that thing that sits between the two, which is kind of added to the power, inclining it to dexterously do the action of speaking Russian. Um, and this is what we mean, therefore, by a habit. So, it's a semi-permanent disposition of one of these powers of the soul, which ones we'll say in a minute, which inclines those actions, uh, inclines those powers to certain actions. Now, when we say which ones it can, which ones of those powers can actually have such a habit, actually it's somewhat limited. Certainly the rational powers over here, both cognitive and repetitive uh, rational powers can have 
these habits, and so can the appetitive powers down here. Now, the reason we say that is because these powers are highly trainable. Uh, if we come down this end of the spectrum, the vegetative powers, they're not really trainable. So if you think about the power to take in nutrition, um, it, it really is a kind of hard-coded uh, possibility within, uh, for example, a, a plant or an animal or a human being. And it only has one possible activity, the taking of nutrients and somehow incorporating them into the substance uh, of the organism. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to talk about uh, a habit here. You can't train it. I mean, it can be useful if you could train it, because it could mean, you know, for example, you could just eat, eat complete junk food, but you could train yourself never to absorb those nutrients. But when you had a nice big fat salad, you know, you'd train it to absorb them. But we know that's not the case. The nutritive power have a sort of one-to-one -one, um, act, act, action. Uh, you put food in and it breaks it down and absorbs it uh, into you. So they don't have habits. So when we talk about semi-permanent dispositions of certain powers of the soul, we are primarily meaning these powers here and these powers here. These are the trainable uh, powers. Um, now, let's talk about some distinctions within uh, the idea of habits. Uh, for the first part, we make a distinction between good habits and bad habits. So, for example... Uh, habits which are inclining you towards doing things which are contrary to reason, unchastity, uh, cowardliness, and things like this. These are uh, bad habits. And so if we take habit as the genus and then we divide it into its species, things which are inclining the powers of the soul to act in a way which is contrary to the good, true human good, these are going to be vices. Whereas if it's inclining us towards that, uh, those actions which are really compatible and, and uh, with the flourishing of being a human being, then we will call these uh, virtues. So there's a fundamental distinction within the genus of habit. If it's a good habit, we'll call it a virtue. If it's a bad habit, uh, we will call that a vice. Uh, another distinction that we can make uh, within habits would be uh, in regards to how they get to be in us. Um, if they get to be in us through repeated action, we call those acquired habits, and they're the ones we uh, are most uh, familiar with. But there are also habits which can be put in us by direct activity of God when we call these things uh, infused habits. Um, so uh, the most obvious infused habits are the theological virtues, because if you think about it, theological virtues are not uh, coming to be in us by repeated action. That's very different from something like um, learning a language, which is clearly in us by repeated action, um, or even chastity, which is in us by repeated action. These are sort of called acquired habits. But if it's put in us by infusion directly by God, then it's called an infused habit. Now, normally, the we can also sort of line up that distinction. So acquired virtues versus infused virtues. We can line that up uh, with natural and supernatural because clearly infused habits like um, the theological virtues, not only are they in us by infusion, they are also um, supernatural, meaning they have as their object God. They have something uh, and they incline us to actions which are beyond our nature to to. Uh, sent to truths which we cannot um, clearly see, uh, which is the action of faith or loving God as God loves himself. Supernatural actions. So these are supernatural habits. But it is actually technically possible to have a natural habit, even a language, for example, placed in us by infusion. I mean, it's not common, but we seem to have um, some situations, uh, you know, some of the stories of the saints imply that uh, they, they came to certain natural capacities, but in a supernatural mode. From, uh, Catherine of Siena, for example, seems to have learned to read by sort of divine infusion rather than um, uh, by, uh, by, by learning. So that's, what, well, that's a distinction. Then. So acquired versus infused, one of the distinctions I'm interested in, and then natural versus supernatural. Uh, the, the third distinction would be moral versus intellectual. And here the issue is uh, whether the, the virtue is really perfecting us at a purely intellectual level or is perfecting us, you might say, a somewhat deeper level, making us good moral actors. So, for example, um, if you learn a language like Russian, I mean, you may be an excellent linguist, but it doesn't make you an excellent person. 
there's a perfection then coming to the intellect, and therefore we call this an intellectual virtue. But there isn't a perfection which comes to the person as, as, as a moral character. Um, you know, maybe a great physicist, but you might use that as an intellectual uh, virtue or habit. Um, uh, but it doesn't make you a good person. You might use your knowledge of physics, uh, physics to do something evil, for example. But if you are chaste and if you are courageous and if you are just and if you are prudent, uh, you can't actually misuse those habits because they incline you at a much deeper level to be a good moral person, to be a good human being. And in fact, um, in the Thomistic system, I think it's possible to say that um, intellectual virtues, yeah, that term is used, but because those things we're thinking of, like language and, and skill, skills like um, or, or knowledge like um, being a physicist, precisely because they don't make us good persons, we would even hesitate to use the word virtue in re relation to them. It might be better just to call them intellectual habits because they're not making us good individuals. Uh, it's really the moral virtues which make us good human beings, you know, patience, for example, magnanimity, these kind of things that really deserve uh, the name of virtue. Okay, so now I'm going to finish this presentation now. I'm going to do a second one, but I just want to summarize uh, what, I, what I've tried to cover. What I tried to cover is a basic uh, definition of a habit as this semi-permanent disposition of a power of the soul. I haven't spoken into the idea of semi-permanence. Uh, I'll do that in the next presentation. Um, the point here is we have powers and we have actions. So each power has its particular action. Uh, for example, the, uh, the repetitive sensitive powers have all the actions which we give uh, the names of emotions to, desire, and anger, and daring, and things like this. So powers have actions. But actually, something can come between the power and the action. You might say something can be added to the power, which inclines it to act in certain ways. And that's what we mean by habits. When those habits are good, they're inclining us to good actions, we use the word virtue. And then we can make certain distinctions even within the realm of those virtues between how they get into us. Is it by acquisition, of, by repeated action, or is it by infusion? Uh, are they natural? Are they perfecting us in natural actions or in supernatural actions? Are they perfecting us at a moral level or just at an intellectual level? Okay, now, yeah, I think that's what we covered so far. Okay, so greetings again. In the previous presentation, we looked really at the definition and certain distinctions between uh, within the idea of habits, so definition of habits and then distinction within uh, habits. Um, let's think a little bit then how um, habits get to be in us. Well, here we have to make a distinction between the acquired and the infused habits because clearly, according to that distinction, the infused habits come in by direct activity of God. So, for example, if you're thinking of the theological virtues, which are infused habits, um, they come in by uh, by being in a state of grace. Now, normally they would come to us in baptism, because in baptism, habitual sanctifying grace is infused into the essence of the soul. And then because that grace is there, um, necessarily flowers, what happens is there's a flowering of, of certain habits in the different powers of the soul. So faith in the intellect and um hope and charity in the will. So that's coming by a very sort of uh, supernatural direct activity. The acquired habits, um, for example, the cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, justice, prudence, um, they come uh, by repeated activity, as do these intellectual habits like languages or, or other habits which are actually more artistic, like being able to play the piano or something like that, the musical habit. Um, now, uh, the root of them is really uh, an intellect, is an inclination which is kind of hard coded in us, an inclination towards the good and towards the truth. If we didn't have an inclination towards the good or to the truth, then we wouldn't really have um, the first rung on the ladder or, or what is needed in order to actually bring about the, uh, the presence of any acquired virtue at all. But Apart from that, we really don't have anything um, other than that which um, impels us towards the virtues. That really is the seed of all the virtues, so the inclination we have towards the good and towards um, the truth. And what happens is that, um, you know, we start off really with just the power and the ability to produce an action. So you think about learning to play the piano or any musical instrument instrument. 
you, if you have an intellect, you have the capacity to do that. Of course, you need some bodily dexterity, but um, it's fundamentally, music is fundamentally in, uh, a spiritual or um, reality, uh, meaning an, an, an incorporeal reality. It's, it's a habit in the soul. Um, and uh, first of all, you have to kind of force yourself to do the action. Uh, so, you know, you, you form your fingers in a certain way and then you press down on the keys or or learning a language. First of all, you have to sort of force yourself to say the words and they don't always come out as you wish they would come out a bit garbled. Um, uh, but then what happens is that when the action which flows from the power passes away, um, the action actually kind of leaves an imprint on the power, which inclines it more towards that very same action. So you know that as you practice the piano, then actually, though your activities have gone away, the next day when you come to the piano, it's actually easier to do exactly the same thing. And the reason it's easier is because though the action has passed away, that activity has left an imprint or a habit in you, in the intellect, which, in, which inclines you again to do that activity. Um, and so there's a kind of positive lead, sort of positive feedback mechanism, if we can put it that way. We have the power which produces the action and it leaves a little habit which then inclines the power more to the action again. And as it does the action uh, better and more firmly, then the action passes away. But it leaves a deeper imprint in the power of the soul. And this deeper imprint is this um, is this habit which inclines us again to do the action. So there's a kind of that's what I mean by a kind of positive feed, feedback loop in in acquired virtues, um, and that's how they that's how they grow. They're going to grow by doing the action again and again and again. Uh, now you have to do the action with uh, with at least equal intensity to your capacity to do the action. Uh, and if you want to grow in the habit, you've got to actually do the the action with greater intensity than the habit actually allows you to do. What do I mean by that? Well, just think about it. You know, if if you became rather fluent on the piano, you got to grade eight or whatever it is, but then you practiced each day for three hours, but you only ever played Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star with one hand or something like that, then because you're not actually doing the action to the to the intensity you're able to do it, you would actually start to slip back. The habit would start to wane in you. So in order for an acquired habit to grow, you have to do the action at least with the same intensity that the habit allows you to do the action. That's going to also be true of moral virtues like uh, temperance. Um, you've got to do acts of temperance with equal, uh, with intensity which you are capacitated to do by the fact that you have a habit of a certain um, greatness or strength uh, in you. Uh, when we talk about the growth of habits there, really, we don't mean a kind of quantitative gro growth, um, like, you know, like you, you you talk about a bowl of water getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's really that uh, it's a power to act more intensely. So the person who is more chaste is, has a, has a uh, you might say, a greater quantity of chastity in the sense of their actions are more determined by the virtue of chastity. It's more like a kind of deeper penetration to your very core. That's what we mean by growth uh, in, in a habit. Now, um, infused virtues can also grow. Theological virtues, faith and charity, can also grow, uh, uh, but they grow in proportion to grace. So how does that work? Well, initially, say, in baptism, one is infused with grace, and then, as I said, in the, in the powers of the soul are going to be the theological virtues are going to flower. Then as you do actions of faith, so, for example, uh, you go into the church and you bow down before the tabernacle and you make an act of faith, of, of belief, of Christ's substantial presence there in the tabernacle. Well, that's an action which is meritorious. It's, a, it's an action which God is going to reward with an infusion of grace. So you get a deeper infusion of grace. And the deeper infusion of grace means that you have uh, a greater faith. So there's also a kind of positive feedback loop here. But there's an extra sort of element in the chain. That element is the element of merit. You now, in a state of grace, have the theological virtue of faith. On account of that, you are inclined to do acts of faith. Those acts are meritorious in the sight of God who infuses more grace into you. And by that, you increase in the theological virtue of faith and you are capable of more 
intense acts of faith. So that's how that's going to uh, operate. The loss of the habits, um, again, if we talk about how do you lose these habits, then uh, we I intimated a little bit already what that would be in regard to the acquired, but we do have to make a distinction here between acquired and infused habits. Um, you can lose an acquired habit by simply just stop doing it. If you stop speaking a language or you stop playing the piano, then you know in time you, it becomes uh, less and less and less uh, uh, disposition in you. Um, that's also true of the theological virtue, so the moral virtues. Um, so, you know, if you start doing less intense acts of courage or fortitude, then you will also start to become more and more or less and less brave, more and more uh, uh, cowardly. Um, the difference here is between the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues is that actually the moral virtues also have their opposites, um, which is not true of the intellectual virtues. So you can do an unchaste act, which will then destroy, not immediately, but it will certainly dent and begin to destroy your virtue of chastity. Um, but there's not really an opposite to, to Russian. It's not like you can speak anti-Russian, which, which kind of somehow destroys your virtue, intellectual virtue of speaking Russian. I mean, you could learn another language, and for that reason, you spend less time on your Russian, and that could cause it to, to wane. But that's not because somehow French or German is contrary to Russian. It's just you don't have time now to, to speak Russian so much. So... Um, so anyway, there's therefore a distinction, a little bit of distinction between how we lose uh, moral virtues and how we lose uh, intellectual uh, virtues. Um, with the, uh, uh, but they don't assume the point I was making. They don't, uh, they don't get lost overnight. Just as you can't acquire them overnight, the acquired virtues they come slowly, slowly, slowly built up in you. You can't lose them instantaneously. So one cowardly act doesn't suddenly turn destroy the virtue of fortitude though it does dent it that's if you think about it that's um factored into our definition of habit because we called it a semi-permanent disposition of one of the powers of the soul semi-permanent means precisely you could lose it but you know it's not something that can just kind of go up in a puff of smoke um it's semi-permanent now, that's not true of the infused virtues, because just as we said, the infused virtues come to us because uh, we have grace infused in us. If we were to do an action which lost the state of grace, then we would actually lose those virtues. Now, uh, there is something to be a little bit nuanced to be said there, and I, I don't think it's the moment to go into that now. Um, but let me just show you what's over the hill. There's something over the hill here. Um, that at least for St. Thomas's point of view, if you do a mortal sin and you lose the state of grace, then you certainly lose the theological virtue uh, of chastity, period. But a kind of remnant of faith and a remnant of hope, St. Thomas believes, can remain uh, in an individual. This kind of mercy of God that he leads that in us, a kind of hook on which he can sort of lasso us uh, back into communion with him. OK, now uh, let's have a look now at the, uh, you might say, the sort of the menu of virtues. And this is what I'm trying to do in this diagram here. Now, you remember from the previous diagram, which was uh, on the powers of the soul, I said there was only certain powers of the soul which we really understand to have habits. Um, and they are the rational in, uh, cognitive power, intellect, rational appetite, the will, the irascible and concupiscible appetites, which are the two sensitive appetites. Um, and uh, here I've tried to diagram the different possible habits that can be members of those different powers. Now, most um, famously, put it that way, we have four cardinal virtues or hind, hinge virtues, temperance, fortitude, justice, and prudence. And each of those is understood to be um, inhabiting and therefore inclining and in skilling, if you can put it that way, one of these powers, so temperance in skills or in powers inclines the concupiscible, fortitude in the irascible, justice in the will, and prudence uh, in the intellect. That kind of makes sense because if you're going to do excellent human actions, and this is really what the habits are about, or the virtues are about, uh, enabling us to do excellent human actions, then given that these powers are really the main powers that, which determine our moral activity, if you're going to be a morally excellent person, you've got to have your intellect set in the right direction, your will, your respiratory, and computer laptop. And therefore, the cardinal virtues 
fundamentally bring about order and goodness in these different powers. They're inclining these powers well. You're all set to do uh, excellent um, moral actions. Now, <clears throat> um, you see that uh, behind here in the sort of peach color, um, so the, the cardinal virtues are in the blue, um, I've spoken or I've written down infused cardinal virtues. That's a position that St. Thomas holds, which not all people hold. I'm not sure the catechism, doesn't, catechism doesn't mention it. It doesn't say it's not true, but it doesn't mention it. And the idea here is that um, because we not only have natural end as human beings, or we're not just um, citizens of a sort of uh, a natural society, we also have a supernatural end and we're citizens of a supernatural society. We actually need infused temperance, infused fortitude, infused justice, infused prudence uh, in order to um, give us what we need to make good actions at a supernatural level. Now, that's something that hopefully we can discuss in the classes, and it's not something I'll discuss now, but at least I just put it out there so you're aware that there is this um, this this reality. The green, you see, these are, my, uh, these are the theological virtues, and the theological virtues, as I said, hope and charity are in the will, and faith is in the intellect. So um, actually in the diagram here, only the blue boxes relate to acquired virtues everything else because these ones up here and the very light sort of beige these are the gifts of the holy spirit which i'll talk about momentarily everything else the peach the green and the beige are infused um, virtues now down the bottom is there's boxes which have a whole bunch of other possible virtues to consider religion friendliness generosity what else have we got magnanimity modesty shame shamefacedness docility look ooh, lots of things now the story here is as follows saint thomas understands the cardinal virtues as hinge hinge virtues um additionally in the following way he thinks that you can trace back any other acquired virtue to one of the cardinal virtues. And this is precisely what he does in the Secunda Secunda. The Secunda Secunda is divided into uh, a consideration, first of all, of the theological virtues, faith and charity, and then a consideration of the cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, justice, and prudence. And all the possible sort of acquired virtues you could think of, like patience, perseverance, magnanimity, honesty, chastity, um, they're all considered under one of the cardinal virtues because he believes that you can kind of, like a hinge, hook any other acquired virtue back to one of the cardinal virtues. And the way he does that is to say, oh, cardinal virtues have parts, he calls them parts, and they have, there are subjective parts, you see this word down here, subjective parts, there are integral parts, ooh, integral parts, and there are potential parts. And on the basis of that division, or this idea of subjective parts of a virtue, integral parts of virtue, <coughs> excuse me, and potential parts of virtue, you can lead back any acquired virtue to one of the cardinal virtues. Now, subjective parts of virtue are like the species of the virtue. Uh, now, temperance, therefore, is almost seen as a kind of generic idea of... of um, the, the desires are, are tempered so that they are orderly and rational. Well, there's multiple challenges for us in there. There's a challenge of sexual intercourse, there's a challenge of food, and there's a challenge of drink. And hence, that's why we can say that we need uh, chastity, which is temperance in regard to sexual intercourse, abstinence, temperance in regard to food, sobriety, temperance in regard to drink. Um, integral parts of a virtue are almost like the ingredients that make up um, the virtue. If you looked under the hood or the bonnet uh, of the virtue, you know what really are the the the, um, the cogs which uh, are needed whenever temperance is being uh, uh, realised or whenever fortitude is being realised. Well, that would be so called the integral part. And I think ingredients is a kind of good word there. Uh, Saint Thomas thinks that shame or shamefacedness and honesty are the ingredients which are always operative in temperance. So. Shame, faceness is, is, is the uh, aversion to, to being disgraced, doing something disgraceful as a human being. And honesty is the attraction to doing that which is good and noble for a human being to do. And he thinks that they are the, the ingredients which are always behind temperance. Potential parts of the virtue 
are kind of annexed virtues, virtues which have something in common with the cardinal virtue, but also somehow fall short from the, the, um, the full throttled nature of the cardinal virtue itself. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, we have here continence. Continence is different from temperance in this way, or at least different from chastity, that, that temperance, um, sorry, chastity, uh, is it really gets to the heart of our sexual desire. It, it makes the sexual desire really reasonable, especially when it's perfected. Whereas continence is not quite like that. Continence really gives us just the power to sort of control it, more like, a, I say, more like a, when you have a dog on a leash, you can at least control the dog, it's not going to run off. Uh, continence is therefore, in a certain sense, an imperfect version of chastity. Now, what's interesting, just to note, and again, hopefully we'll get into this in the, in the classes, so it's not something you need to sort of nail right now, but just be aware of, that um, actually, when we talk about the potential parts of the virtue, they don't necessarily fall under the same power. So strictly speaking, continence is in the will. It's kind of like the will is empowered to just get hold of your sexual desires so they don't cause you absolute chaos. Whereas chastity really is in the concupiscible appetite. It makes the movements of the concupiscible appetite uh, sweet. Now, so look, I dumped a lot of pot on you there, but, but really I'm just trying to give an initial vision here that, that we've, got, uh, we've got habits. These are all the habits, all the colored boxes. They relate somehow back to the different powers of the soul because that's precisely what habits are doing. They are helping the power to, to move in a, in a good manner. We see here in the diagram the difference between the acquired, which are the blue boxes, and all the infused habits, which are the others. We see that we can trace back all these uh, lists and more. I mean, this is only illustrative. It's not exhaustive. All these different um, natural virtues can be traced back to one of the cardinal virtues, and that's in part why we'll talk talk about cardinal virtues. Let me leave you with one other point which I haven't, I need to explain so the diagram sort of makes moderate sense. Um, here, what, 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 are, what are these gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, St. Thomas understands them also as habits because they are semi-permanent dispositions of the powers of the soul to act in certain ways. Um, they're, of course, they're more like the theological virtues because they come with the infusion of grace. You can't acquire them. They kind of sit there and they dispose, they sit in the powers of the soul, and they dispose the powers of the soul to be moved in a very deft way by uh, actions of the Holy Spirit. Um, and to that way, to that sense, then they're habits because they are disposing us to activity. Uh, St. Thomas sees a difference between the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in regards to how much direct activity or how, how much direct motion of the Holy Spirit there is in uh, the actions which flow from them. He thinks with the theological virtues, human reason is much more operative, it's much more the mover and shaker. Um, whereas when we get talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, human reason is a little bit, not, not shoved to the side, but it's a little bit less in the foreground and actually direct motion of the Holy Spirit is, is, is more in the foreground. Um, so that's how he tries to make a distinction between the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what did, what did we try to do in this session? Well, in this session, I wanted to give some indications of uh, the fact that, that uh, the, the virtues can grow in us. How on earth could that be? Well, with the acquired virtues, it's because we have these initial inclinations towards the good and towards the truth. And then as we repeat actions of good and the seeking of the truth, then these habits can grow and grow in us. Obviously, it's different with the infused virtues. They um, are actually put in us by grace. And, of course, the corollary of, of, of that is that the uh, infused virtues can be lost, actually, with a single action because we can lose grace through mortal sin. That's not the case with the acquired virtues. Uh, we can stop doing the action so intensely or we can do a contrary action and then actually we will start to lose the virtue and we will start to get a vice. Yeah, it, we, you're never really in no man's land here. You're either moving towards virtue or you're moving uh, towards vice. Then in this diagram, I wanted to show how the different virtues and gifts, uh, habits in general, relate back to these four important powers for human activity. And I also wanted to show how the cardinal virtues are understood as hinge virtues because we can relate back the other possible human virtues to one of these cardinal virtues. Okay, so I hope that was of some help to you. And um
Right, well, that's enough for me for now. God bless you.